Welcome to another episode of China is Not Our Enemy, um, coming to you from Code Pink. And today I'm very excited to talk to Tings Chok. Tings is an international activist and an artist trained in architecture. And after spending quite a few years as a migrant justice organizer in Toronto, Canada, she's been supporting various working class struggles and movements across the global south. Tings is currently based in Shanghai and contributing to popular political education projects and crafting designs towards a socialist future. She is the lead designer and researcher for Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and one of the editors of the Dongfen Collective, which is why we really wanted to talk to her today because um, here we are, uh, you know, stupid Americans about China being convinced that we should with lies that we should hate China. And instead, she's inside and she's not only inside, but she's, you know, a culture worker. And um, so we want to hear more about the culture from Tings. Tings, um, welcome so much to our show. And also just give us an idea of where you are, how long you've been there, and kind of maybe what part of Shanghai do you live in? What's it like? Thanks, Jody, And thanks to the team for Cold, Cold Pink for inviting me. So I'm in uh, Shanghai right now, as you mentioned. It's a little bit late here. It's about midnight. Um, and so, I mean, it's interesting you ask me that. Uh, most people don't usually move countries in the middle of a pandemic, but that's what, what I did. Um, my partner and I actually moved to um, uh, Shanghai about five, six months ago. Um, and as you mentioned, one of the main works I've been doing, or projects I've been working on in the last years have been, has been the Tricontinental the Institute for Social Research in the area of the, I organized the art department, so both in production and research. And then since, since arriving here, um, a new project was formed out of a, both desire, necessity, and just, you know, curiosity as we were seeing the, the events unfolding here, moving here. Uh, of trying to transport some of the realities that we're seeing here that really aren't captured if you're looking at Western media. They're really captured not only the mainstream media, but even I think a bit lost to a lot of the, I think, our world, which is of the left, of social movements and popular movements. Um, it was kind of clear that there was a, a richer and a deeper story to be told. There was a kind of flattening of what is China's, China, Chinese society, Chinese people that wasn't getting through. So, so in the months of living here and um, with, with different colleagues and friends and comrades, um, a project was formed to form this uh, Dongfeng Collective um, to gather a group of people who are curious and asking questions and reading and researching and trying to gather some of that and sharing that in a, in a form that uh, hopefully is useful uh, for different audiences around the world. Um, and right now we're doing it in, in English as well as Portuguese and Spanish, um, in French and Italian. And we're, we have kind of thoughts for, for other languages as well to specifically reach more of our audience in the, across the global south, um, social movement bases, the kinds of um, uh, organizations we're more linked to. So cool. So it's not just the United States that needs more education on China. <laughs> um, I think it's world over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so since arriving, uh, give me a couple of the things that have surprised you the most. You know, I think one of the first um, conversations I had uh, when I arrived here was actually with an artist, as you mentioned, obviously my areas more around culture and where culture intersects with politics and movements. Um, I had a conversation with this artist from Shanghai um, and he uh, agreed to chat with me. You know, we, I had come across his work online for some time and was curious. So we just had a chat. Um, and basically what he did was he was um, in the first Two months he was in quarantine. He he started to paint uh, two paintings every day. Um, of what was he painting of? You know, it's funny because he was using a traditional um, Chinese paint, paint, like calligraphy style. You might have seen 
kind of the wash um, paintings, very few colors, rice paper. But instead of kinds of landscapes or, you know, um, kind of, which are beautiful, he was painting interesting things like a traffic officer. He's just eating a cup. Oh dear, it seems like we've lost things for the moment. I want to show you a little bit of her art while she finds her way back on the internet. Um, she says, she, you know, she's told you about her art and her work for Tricontinental. So um, maybe if we share screen, uh, we could look at some of Ting's art while we wait for her to come back. Oops. Um, we're just we uh, must do things. <laughs> we're showing a. We were going to show a bit of your art while you were gone. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Great. Here, let me see if I get my screen back normal. Okay, perfect. Well, the good thing is, whenever there are visuals, it all could, always can fill space. Yes, and, there we go. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, where was I? Where did I cut off? You were saying that he he started to paint like a policeman with something in his hand, or. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, the portraits he was painting was about the real lives of people uh, responding and coming together around the coronavirus and the responses. So he was using this very traditional style and he was painting um, exactly kinds of, you know, delivery workers. Uh, we're talking about workers in factories sewing the PPE, protective equipment, um, security guards taking a little nap because, you know, they've been working overtime. And so these kinds of portraits, I think, um, and among and and also the experience of moving here during this time, definitely showed a vision. It's very clear. You do not see in the Western media, and you do not see um, pretty much ever in a portrayal uh, of China and how the story was being told during the crisis, uh, the, during the height of the crisis, and even afterwards. You know, I was just doing a little test right now. I was just trying to Google um, what you see when you see China, you know, the kinds of images that usually kind of come up are kind of, you know, big industrial infrastructure scale projects or people in masses, or you're talking about state leaders, but very rarely do you get these kinds of portraits about, you know, remembering that Chinese people are actually just human beings. And there's a lot of them. It's not 1.4 billion people, but those portraits and stories are never told. And we know a lot of the way that the media works and especially kind of an imperialist form of media is that the first thing that is denied is the people's humanity, is the people's uh, ab ability to be seen as people who are organizing, who are, who are responding, who are um, responding in a very collective way, that they aren't just the victims of history at all, you know, and they're not just victims of their government or victims of a society. So I think in terms of a roundabout way of answering your question of a sur surprises, you know, was encountering and having this conversation with this artist um, is a good reminder, you know, about what the focus should be on. Um, and he he actually, you know, said a few things I was asking him as well, as the world at that point was entering into their moment of crisis, what is also the role of cultural workers and artists? And, and one of the things he was saying, well, we can reflect the situation also positively to bring unity, to, to, to share the experiences of people as they are living them. Um, and he, he said a nice thing too. He said, you know, whether you're in quarantine home, whether you're caring for people or being cared for, whether you're working, you know, at your easels or with your pens and pencils, you're all kind of soldiers in this battle against a united, you know, in a united battle against the pandemic. So I think that was quite useful. Um, and for anyone who's interested, also the his paintings were featured in um, in a three part um, research series publications from Tricontinental. 
actually have it here. It was oh, cool. So his paintings ah, are yes. online. You'll see some of them if you want to check it out on Tricontinental's website. And some of his words are there as well. And that's the issue um, that you did about the lies around coronavirus, correct? Yeah, so the Tricontinental team put together, I mean, it was very clear during the early moments about what um, that the, the reports about what was happening, the responses with um, to the coronavirus was was inadequate, let's say, uh, by Western media. Uh, not only was there a lot of kind of xenophobia, not only against Chinese Chinese people and the state, but there was also just a lot of um, a lot of things we didn't know about how uh, how the response was from the level of the neighborhood committees to the level of the state, how resources were, were dis deployed, how 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 the China was able to um, break the chain of infection in a relatively quick way. Um, so this was a publication that came out um, uh, uh, to address some of these issues, to bring to broader audiences what we couldn't be seeing elsewhere. So um, what's it like in your neighborhood? You know, just uh, maybe a little bit about um, <laughs> how is this neighborhood different than your neighborhood in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, for example? Um, I mean, I think it's a, uh, one of the things I'll, I'll say, I mean, I've had the privilege and through the kind of political work I've been doing to live in various places, um, get to know various places. And in terms of one of the things that also surprised me, I would say, and also relates to kind of the neighborhood, I guess, is <laughs> that, you know, I never felt like I could right now, it's midnight, I could just walk outside, you know, I could go uh, and pick up some things at the corner store as a woman and walk there. And that's something I think I, even my body had forgotten it, it could do, you know? <laughs> and this is in many parts of the world. There are some things I think for me as a woman, definitely there are moments I was quite surprised of uh, security uh, walking around on the streets. I think that would be one, one thing. Um, the neighborhood itself is a, is is kind of a you know a 90s style popular public housing uh, very comfortable very lots of trees uh, modest but has a has like you know here it's a, it's a pretty impressive the amount that they uh, amount of time they spend on 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 landscaping and you know you'll see like overpasses like huge overpasses and they'll have little containers with like plants on them um, like on the highways, it's really quite something. <laughs> yeah, the green, the care for nature is profound. Um, and even the care for ancient nature. Uh, some of the places that you go where they, you know, you think about a museum and they're showing art, but if you go there in, in China, it's the whole thing is cared for. All, all pieces of the container are important, uh, which is, something I hadn't ever experienced. Yeah, I had the experience in Beijing recently to go to um, the Red Brick Art Museum. Um, it was my first time there. Uh, and it's exactly that. Um, it's, it almost feels like the, you know, the art you see inside, which is a very contemporary art museum. Uh, it was reflections on, on kind of, they called state of exception and different artists responding to that. But on the outside, it is basically just a, a magical garden, so both inside, outside, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, very, very embodied experiences, let's say, of art. <laughs> so let's talk about Dongfeng. I mean, here you are, you're, you have a desire to raise up some, some stories that the world is not seeing. Tell us some of, some of the surprises in searching and, and maybe some of the gems you have to leave on the cutting room floor. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah. So Dong Feng, it's a pretty simple concept of how what we how we approached coming up with this um, weekly uh, digest of news sources from China or on China, mostly from China. Um, I mean, you asked me what was surprising. One of them was talking about the experience of pandemic and the responses and the kind of uh, kind of how much this uh, society is a, still remains a very collective one in its, you know, in treatment of its people and its responses to crisis. So that's one thing. The other thing is definitely a, 
really big shock of how poor our knowledge is for those coming outside of, of China to China about just basically anything. And so we started reading and reading a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I, like, I like the campaign title, you know, that you have, which is China is not the enemy, because it seems like a simple phrase to say, but then it almost still, it feels necessary to say that, you know, <laughs> it feels necessary in this moment to say that because we have very little news that brings that um, uh, voices that are actually from China to the world. So we take 15 stories, uh, we take dozens of stories uh, in a team and we read them, we share them, we kind of, you know, do pitches about them. And, and then we choose 15 every week where we do little short summaries and do links. Um, so they have different themes. So well, geopolitics, obviously, can't be avoiding geopolitics in this moment. That's the key theme of our day. Uh, to national politics issues, so national issues, there's economy, and also issues like you brought up, environment, agriculture, big questions that we have, um, and health. Then the debates around science and technology, and then another aspect, which is people's life and culture, which I already talked a little bit about, a big part of you know, you'll see if you read the digest at the end, at last section of every digest is always bringing, trying to bring some of this cultural element, bring some of these more real life people's stories. Put the links in the chat, tricontinental and, the, and. And then we also have, um, you know, actually this week we just launched a weekly video that's also trying to bring more of these visual elements to highlight the stories um, and photos. Uh, and all these things is is brings a little richer discussion um, uh, to the point of the digest. But in terms of gems, it's almost it's it's like quite hard. Uh, we learned so many things in this process. Um, I think one of the things, for instance, I, I mean, I think you're also your your listeners or viewers and members of Code Pink are interested in stories about women. You know, we try to bring some of those two from historical figures that we're learning about. There's a comrade who passed away. Her name is Wang Dingko, who was part of the Long March. It was in 1934 where um, the Communist Party and you know, thousands and thousands of soldiers had to flee uh, persecution. And they walked for one year across thousands and thousands of kilometers. Um, and she is a story. She just passed away. So she was recounting the story of how she was part of the theatrical group, you know, doing these kinds of journeys and being in the army meant you had to really employ culture in a ne necessary way. You know, how to keep the morale up, how to entertain people on like, you're crossing mountains filled with snow and valleys, you know, and many people didn't make it and, and many people couldn't stand the, the hardship. It was amazing because we learned about her because she had actually been sold to her husband when she was 15 years old and she escaped. She ran away when she was 20 to join the party and, you know, lifelong committed member until she, she died. I think she was 104 years old. So we hear, we see kinds of lots of stories like this that are just absolute gems. Um, and I think there's another uh, story that really impacted me um, is about a, a, it's a story called the Red Detachment of Women. Um, it's also around the time of the 1930s. Um, it, it's based on a real story, but it became um, essentially a popular culture mythology. You know, it has filmed since the 60s. It has become a national ballet. And now it's become an, a, a huge production um, that plays nightly in Hainan, which is the southern um, province. It's an island province, the most tropical area of, of China. So it's like palm trees and beaches and all beautiful things like that. But beyond the beauty of that, it's also a place where um, the first uh, armed group of women decide to leave. They're all peasant women who were like, you know, basically enslaved by feudal lords. Uh, decided that they need to organize and they need to fight against, you know, the, the Nationalist Party, they had to fight against imperialism. And that's become, I mean, there's a play, I actually had a chance to go see this play. Um, and you'll see, you, it fits like 2000 people moving stages, big lights, like, like you're in the middle of the, you know, the whole, whole, whole deal. 
and you're seeing kids, families, multi-generational families go there. Um, you'll see, you know, people even arguing with the play as if they're watching like a soap opera. It's like very, very popular, very interactive in that way. And then when you leave, it's people, all the, all the women actors, hundreds of them dressed in their, you know, Red Army outfits. And all the kids are going up, taking photographs and selfies. And I thought, I was like, this is, this is incredible. This is incredible, but a story from the 1930s about women fighting against patriarchy, fighting against, you know, feudalism, fighting against landlords, fighting against imperialism is a relevant story for little kids to take selfie. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not Mickey Mouse, you know? So there's some <laughs> things that are just incredible to think, like that kind of interest in what they call here red culture, like a, a socialist or a leftist culture. Certainly things you won't see ever in news, you know, about what, what, the, what China looks like. But I think, I mean, I've been talking more about the kind of cultural, the historical cultural aspects, but just to point out how also culture has evolved and, and stayed relevant with people. You know, this is a story maybe from the 30s, but they've kind of reinvented in a way that has, that's very much of 2020, uh, that speaks to the young people of 2020. Uh, that, that I think is pretty incredible. And that's not even to speak well, of. Well, I think what's interesting about that is that the government is, is, willing to have a, a piece of, of theater that's about an uprising, <laughs> you know, as, a, as a, a group of, you know, revolutionary women, uh, it's not what people want the story to be told about. Uh, they yeah. don't want to know, they don't want to know about that. <laughs> that's super interesting. You know, one of the things that I noticed, a couple of the feedbacks that I've gotten on Dongfeng was, I remember one issue the cover photo was um, a trans um, newscaster on one of the biggest broadcasting companies. And some of the people around me were just like, trans exist in China. Like that was the shocker of that. That's how silly everybody's view. I remember when I was taking photos of wedding parties and there were lesbian couples and people just didn't believe me that that existed in China. So even just the basic, um, you know, I, I think there was an article recently about um, uh, a sex change at the work and how the, the guy was won a case. Um, and, you know, that those the struggles go on in China as they go on uh, around the world. and. Um, it's not what people think about China. Um, and I think one of the other things, even what, uh, uh, someone who runs a you know, pretty radical think tank was just like blown away by the fact that so many Chinese people, I think it's over 90% understand the dangers of climate change and um, are pushing their governments, their local governments to do more. Uh, we, yeah, let's, you know, climate change, that's not, you know, how sometimes when I talk about China, people are like, but they're the ones destroying the planet. Now, these are people from the United States <laughs> who have the biggest uh, footprint in the world. But um, what have you seen about uh, taking care of the planet? I mean, I think, I mean, I think with the, the environment question, which I mentioned, like, it's something that we came with a lot of curiosity. I mean, there's, 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 we have one section that's on agriculture and environment, we put them together and because they're pretty inseparable. You know, we started this conversation when you made it, you made a joke about Monsanto, you know, this, we know critically the survival of the planet and survival of the people are, you know, completely interconnected. Um, there's a few things we've been quite surprised. I think the the government here is really aware that there are environmental issues, you know, um, and the, that the, the kinds of, you know, the biggest issues people face right now are things from air quality to food security, to food safety, to, you know, um, and all those things. And so we've been kind of following the stories of how that's been responded to. One of the surprises, for instance, this that came out, I think last, last issue or two issues ago uh, was that, um, it, well, I'll just give a little context. China has 1.4 billion people it's to give a context, it's 20% of the world's population, but it only has 8% of the arable land, so the farmable land. 
that is a mathematically it's a question you know it's a lot of to feed people has always historically been one of the greatest challenges of this country so it requires a lot of growth in other places but in the middle of all this it's a you know it's a food insecure time let's say um, two weeks ago, there was a, we launched a story about Kafka, which is one of the state-owned, one of the biggest uh, food and agriculture companies, that they've announced that they're going to start, for instance, um, tracking where the soybean comes from, because soy consumption and a lot of soy production in a lot of the world actually gets exported to China. That's not news to anyone. But they're actually starting to track it with the, with the end of saying, oh, we're not going to start, we're going to stop buying from any place that is um, illegal deforesting areas. Uh, so they've highlighted specifically places like the Amazon and, you know, other protected areas in Brazil. I mean, this is not a small statement for being the largest soy importer of the world of doing this. And, and why is that also important? Because there's a lot of um, uh, questions about, you know, securing enough grain to feed the people, you know, securing enough soy securing for the animals and all that. Um, this, this last week, we also put a story uh, about, um, food grains, so that's this rice and wheat and all those things. Um, even though there's great production here, despite the big floods, you might have seen some stories about you know, historic floods here that, you know, was devastating for a lot of the crops. Um, uh, there's a big fear about food shortage and also with the heightened, uh, you know, kind of tensions with the U.S. There's a real threat of, you know, a food war even. Um, but just a few days ago, uh, Xi Jinping came out with a new campaign, a big campaign about food waste, basically reprimanding and saying to the whole country, listen, um, you know, everyone's arrived at a level of consumption that we've never seen before, but this food waste is not acceptable. You know, we're talking about on average, it's 11% of food being wasted um, per person. At, uh, you go out to restaurants and meals. This is food to feed millions and millions of people if from the waste. So what I thought was really interesting is you used the main kind of uh, slogan or saying, which in fact, my mom drilled into my head since I was a kid, like <laughs> really drilled, which is that every grain of rice is a sweat of a farmer. So I have like both Mao and Xi Jinping's voice in my head now. So reminding me. <laughs> But I mean, even in a few days, the, the amount of campaigns, what does it look like from social media platforms? How are they responding to it? How does it, you know, uh, how does it actually get played out? It's pretty um, decisive. It's something that um, people will respond to and are hearing. It makes a difference. So that those are a couple surprises about, you know, uh, about the environment and food issues. And you what about around. just recycling? Uh, tell me about yeah. your own personal recycling. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, recycling here, and um, um, my partner is Brazilian. And there's less recycling in Sao Paulo where we lived, and here now it's like you know it's a real strong duty. You know, they're they're <laughs> just to give you an example of how how it's organized in this small community. It's like you know very set hours, and then you have you know your organics, you have your different types of recyclables, you then you have your, uh, your non recyclables, there's people who help you there, there's a little hand washing station to help you wash your hands afterwards. Uh, it's pretty quite organized. But it's been impressive because this is still a pretty new concept here, you know, to think about um, use of plastics. Uh, this is all about public education as well. Um, and of course, it's been heightened by the fact that the months of Corona uh, virus means that there's been a lot more deliveries like the rest of the world, deliveries and consumption of plastics. So what two of the big campaigns has been against banning plastics in um, a lot of the uh, a lot of these delivery, as well as like utensils, other kinds of stuff, cups and chopsticks and that kind of thing um, to um, to organizing um, mass recycling composting systems. And they're going to start with, they've started in Shanghai, Beijing, and big cities, but they're going to launch them in the 80 big cities soon. So these are kinds of, you know, pretty nas nationwide projects that they're part public education that will take time to also change the habits of people. But um, I love the hand washing station. I think it really helps encourage because, you know, sometimes you have all this organic stuff and you just, you know, wash your hands a little bit before you go to work. <laughs> oh my god that's so lovely what are some other of the rituals that you notice that are different from let's say your your life in you know toronto or sao paulo or uh south africa that are you know it's just 
that you feel the cultural difference. It was beautiful, like what it is to be a woman. Um, what about uh, public transportation? Is Do you find that different or the same? I mean, Shanghai, I think since I, uh, I live near a subway line, um, it's a it's a pretty, um, I mean, with all the, the days I take trans, transport, one thing, unlike other, any other city I've ever lived in is I've never seen a, I've never seen a, one of those delays. I mean, I'm making a joke, but, uh, but I think overall the city, Shanghai is one of the kind of wealthier, um, very cosmopolitan cities. So it has a really developed infrastructure for that. Um, I don't know, in terms of other kinds of, uh, uh, daily life, um, things, I don't have anything that comes to mind. There's so many, I guess, that sometimes on the top of your head, you don't really think about it in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and um, has there been a lot of interest in Dongfeng? Have you found, are you getting response from the readers? Are you getting, uh, you know, usually when, when you have an audience, they, they kind of want the what they want. Um, are you hearing from your audience that um, more is missing than what you're delivering? Yeah, I mean, overall, I think the, the response has been overwhelmingly very positive. I think even more positive than the whole team working on this has expected. And it was very quick that, you know, uh, the project has grown. You know, I mentioned all the language it's in and there's already other languages um, coming up. We're starting to do videos and we're already planning um, other other forms um, to to share the content. I think it's just clear right now. There's there's been a not just right now, but for for a long time, there's been a huge hunger and absence um, of of information coming, uh, not mediated just by you know through New York or through Washington or through London, but actually some some sources and voices coming from here. Um, and what is interesting is that a lot of the information is is there. But it takes a lot to, you know, both experiences of being being here and observing and following, but also reading through and collecting it all. Um, we've received really amazing personal feedback, you know, um, from 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 Cuba to you know Spain to Portugal to South Africa to Morocco to pretty much like dozens and dozens of countries. Uh, we've we've gotten. Uh, responses not only from you know activists from social movements to leaders of social movements to academics journalists um, uh, it's clearly a necessity uh, and right now we're living in a, in a so, world. so yeah. it's kind of why we have China is not our enemy because there's there's this big vacuum with no definition which makes it very easy to throw tomatoes at but it's super serious for us in the United States because um, at a time when, you know, global superpowers should be getting along and solving these really intense problems. Um, we're watching hate and lies driven. Um, you know, in what time we have left, why, what would you say to the audience of like, why, why should they make sure that China is not our enemy? Like, what do you see? How do you, what do you see and feel there? Do you feel an enemy? Do you feel concerned? Do you, I mean, I always say uh, about my husband that he lives in the future, or at least the future I want to live in. Um, what What is something that really could communicate that, you know, China is not only our enemy, it could be a really great friend? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that the, um, yeah, I like what you said in terms of living in the future. Um, I simply feel like I've been transported into the future. Um, I mean, I think I'll use an example. Like this week, one of the stories was that uh, among the many, many, many different groupings that have been put onto this foreign mission list by the U.S., um, now they've added Confucius Institutes, which is, you know, uh, a grouping uh, of of um, educational institutes, culture sharing institutes, you know, where people get to learn across universities, campuses, and school campuses how to uh, exchange with another culture. I mean, that's that's essential. Um, it seems very clear if that is kind of put on a list of our enemies, there's something really misguided about how we, we can foster a kind of human understanding about a different people. I mean, 
if learning about calligraphy or the poetry or history of another society, let alone its people's daily life experiences, uh, realities, concerns, or aspirations, what they think about is denied, then I mean, that is, um, that's pretty tragedy. And I feel like we should feel angry about that. You know, we should feel like we're being denied a possibility to engage. Um, and certainly, I mean, from the experiences that we've had here, uh, coming here at this time, there's so much learning to be done from here. There's so much that is impressive about how society organizes organize itself, how the people are put ahead of all else, how even ahead of the economy, you know, how, how people band together, the kinds of values, the kinds of, um, how the values are deployed in a, in a systematized way, in a, a way that, you know, is, is actually organized. It has planning and all these things. I mean, we're seeing uh, just basically this, this um, mass of people who are impoverished, who are generally black and brown, who are in many of the places of the world in the capitalist world that has all this abundance being thrown to the side right now. You know, if there's something that we want to learn, of course, we have to be on the side of the people. So that's all to say, it's a, it's a loss for everyone of us if we don't get to learn more about what, is, what has happened here um, exchange more and we hope we can, you know, as Dongfang Collective, be a bit more of that bridge, provide a little more information, learn, hear, get feedback about what are the kind of burning questions and try to fulfill some of that um, because that bridging is more necessary than ever. Oh my God, what a beautiful way to end because it's really, you are a peacemaker there. What you're creating with Dongfang Collective is the path to peace, so super grateful. Um, I wanted to just, you know, when we say that someone's an artist, um, we have an opportunity to show a little bit of your art and I just wanted to share the screen and show some of your uh, tri-continental covers and let everyone know that they can follow you um, on Instagram at Ting's Chalk and um, also uh, that that we've put in the chat um, where, where you can subscribe to John Adong Fang Collective and also the Tricontinental. And there's a, the issue that she showed you the photographs out of is a great way to get smarter about China and um, COVID. And I, I just, you know, last night there was um, a big party in Wuhan and it was trending in the United States. It was a pool party. And um, when, you, when we, we talk about the future, it was there where, you know, Americans were looking at it kind of in, in, in crazy envy of just huddled all together, um, dancing and at a pool party. And um, a little, uh, some, someone from China said, this is what happens when central government acts decisively to crush COVID. The whole city locks down, a hospital is built in seven days, 11 million tested, and three months later, we live in normal. And um, I think that was a hard tweet to, to read when we're at the most deaths a day here um, and in so many places around the world. So thank you, Tings. Thanks for joining us. You're amazing. Thanks for all the beauty you bring into the world all the connection. Thank you, thank you. Take good care.